Greetings, and thank you for joining us for the 2021 Catholic Social Tradition Conference, or CST for short, at the University of Notre Dame. Sponsored by Notre Dame Center for Social Concerns, this year's conference celebrates the 50th anniversary of the core Catholic document, Justice in the World. And I'm delighted to chair this session focused on labor. My name is Dan Graff, and I direct the interdisciplinary Higgins Labor Program here at the Center for Social Concerns. Named for Catholic priest, labor economist, and fierce union advocate, Monsignor George Higgins, the Higgins Labor Program explores questions about work, the politics of work, and the work of social justice, all through the lens of CST principles, such as the dignity of work, the right of everyone, not only to decent work, but also a voice at the workplace, and a commitment to the common good. Please use your favorite browser to look up the Higgins Labor Program and our signature research and advocacy project, the Just Wage Initiative. The three experts featured on our panel tonight and the organizations that they represent have all taught me a great deal about just wages. Indeed, justice in the world of work more broadly. All three have spent their careers advocating for the same tenets enunciated in the document we're commemorating. It is impossible, the World Synod of Catholic Bishops wrote 50 years ago, to conceive true progress without recognizing the necessity of a development composed both of economic growth and participation. Demands that progress and growth must be more widely shared as well as paired with inclusion, diversity and equity are as urgent in 2021 as they were in 1971. I've asked our distinguished panelists to address some of the most pressing labor issues and opportunities facing us today each focusing at a different level. Kevin Cassidy, US representative for the International Labor Organization will speak to the global. Thea Lee, president of the Economic Policy Institute will address the national. And Karen Kent, president of Unite Here Local One in Chicago will take us to the local. I'll introduce each in turn and they'll each speak for up to 15 minutes. After that, we'll have a conversation that includes questions from the attendees. And to that end, I encourage all you attendees to utilize the Q&A function button uh, probably at the bottom of your Zoom screen, addressing questions to any or all of the panelists at any time during the presentations or afterwards. Thanks again for joining us for this event tonight, at least tonight where I am at in South Bend, Indiana. And thanks in particular to those most responsible for organizing and producing this conference, Bill Purcell, Paula Mueller, and everyone else at the Center for Social Concerns and at Notre Dame Studios. We'll start with Kevin Cassidy, who has over four decades of international development experience. The current director of the ILO, the International Labor Organization, Office for the United States, Kevin, prior to that, served as the Senior Communications and Economic and Social Affairs Officer in the ILO Office for the United Nations, and he was also the ILO's Chief Technical Advisor for the ILO's Global Campaign on Promoting Fundamental Rights at Work. During that time, he developed numerous communication initiatives in over 40 countries, such as interactive radio and television programs, as well as trainings for journalists on communicating locally on decent work, child labor, forced labor, discrimination, and the freedom of association. In short, Kevin has a wealth of expertise and insight to share on the global picture for work, workers, and development at the current moment. Kevin, welcome and thank you. Dad, thank you very much. And thank you to the Center for Social Concerns and Notre Dame University for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, I'd like to begin just a little bit to give you an overview of what the ILO is. The International Labor Organization is actually the first multilateral organization established by the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 alongside the League of Nations. The ILO is a technical agency of the UN. It is tripartite in nature, which means that it is comprised of governments, workers, and employers. 
Uh, we work with the AFL-CIO and the U.S. Council for International Business as my counterparts. The ILO also has a normative role uh, through the development, setting, and supervision of international conventions and standards in the world of work. It's also a technical advisory organization uh, which provides assistance to the 187 member states to review the, and develop their legislation to make sure that it's consistent with international standards. And we also have a seat at the table with the G7, the G20, the OECD, the World Bank, uh, and other international financial institutions. The ILO's um, mission and objectives can really be summed up as a quest for social justice and decent work. The message of the ILO and the animating vision are undeniably clear in our two foundational documents. The ILO's constitution and its preamble states that whereas universal and lasting peace can be established only if it is based on social justice. And secondly, the ILO's Declaration of Philadelphia, uh, which was signed in Temple University in 1944, uh, stated that labor is not a commodity, that freedom of expression and of association are essential to sustain progress, poverty anywhere constitutes a danger to prosperity everywhere, and that the war on want uh, requires unrelenting vigor within each nation. So, over the last 100 years, these concepts have been deepened by the ILO's international conventions and protocols and recommendations, and our values have been placed into the context of three declarations, which I just want to briefly mention. In 1998, the Declaration on Fundamental Rights at Work uh, has uh, been signed by almost uh, every country uh, on the planet uh, and is the basis for the UN's guiding principles on business and human rights and uh, for example, is stated in the labor provisions of the USMCA trade agreement. The second declaration is the Declaration on Social Justice for a Fair Globalization, which was actually a, um, a foundational document for the framing of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And then recently on the occasion of our centenary, the Centenary Declaration for the Future of Work uh, has uh, looked at this transformative world of work and provides a guide to the ILO's human-centered approach. Um, also, before I get into the impact of COVID-19, I'd like to also just give a frame of the ILO and uh, the Holy See. The ILO's first Director General, Albert Tomas, had recognized that the encyclical uh, letter Rerum Novarum of uh, May 15, 1891, by Pope Leo XIII as a source of a great movement and one of the first papal letters on social justice. In 1924, uh, our Director General met with Pope Pius XI uh, in order to propose a more formal collaboration between the ILO and the Holy See. And this close relationship was recognized in the official visits by Pope, uh, Pope Paul VI in 1969, at a time when the ILO had won the Nobel Prize. Uh, in 1982, uh, John Pope Paul II had visited us. And uh, we also share these basic values of upholding human dignity, solidarity, and social justice. Uh, the ILO actually has a continued uh, a connection with the Vatican through the appointment of a special representative by the Vatican, uh, who is actually an ILO official and provides input on a range of issues. Um, for your interest, the ILO does have a handbook called Convergences, Decent Work and Social Justice in Religious Traditions, which helps frame the ILO's approach uh, through the regular interreligious groups that we meet at the ILO. In looking at COVID-19, uh, we know that it has had a massive impact on the global labor markets, and it's been the most severe crisis since the depression of the 1930s, and even greater than the impact of the global financial crisis in 2009. Uh, when we compare the last quarter of 2019, our analysis shows that 8.8% of global working hours have been lost. That's the equivalent of 255 million full-time jobs. Half of this uh, working hours lost uh, are accounted for by the reduced hours of those in employment. But really more importantly, the rest comes from an unprecedented level of unemployment. 114 million people have lost their jobs. The majority of this employment loss, 71% or 81 million people has translated into inactivity, which basically means that people have dropped out of the labor market. ILO estimates are showing that there is a significant variation across and within labor markets and uh, the disadvantaged uh, are, who have already been hard hit are even uh, further uh, disadvantaged. Uh, women and particularly women of color, young people have been most affected. 
Um, we've also seen massive losses in global labor income, which is equivalent to $3.7 trillion. This is representing 4.4% of the global gross domestic product. Um, but we also have to look at the impact of COVID, not just that unemployment, uh, which would only drastically understate the impact and certainly would not help uh, policymakers in building back better. Um, the recovery, uh, we are seeing some uh, green sprouts on that, but it is uneven and there are great uncertainties and we are worried uh, that this, um, um, the uh, unbalanced recovery may increase inequalities between and within countries. Um, the speed of that recovery will depend on a range of economic and health factors, such as the rollout of vaccines and also the selection of the right economic and social policies. But overall, policy interventions must focus on a robust and broad-based recovery by addressing employment, income, workers' rights, and social dialogue. Um, I'd like to speak now a little bit about the distributional impact of COVID-19. COVID-19 crisis has had an uneven impact between, and, uh, between countries and sectors, and the countries to be greater impacted uh, and will obviously impact more on women, young people, and vulnerable, worker, uh, vulnerable workers. Adding to this, uh, the uneven effects of the crisis of post-support labor income. Um, post-support labor income refers to all income linked to work, including any income support measures. We've done an analysis of five countries, uh, Brazil, Italy, Peru, United Kingdom, United States, and Vietnam, and we present six major findings which we believe are hold true on all income levels. Firstly, Working hour losses have led to large reductions in labor income, and the impact of post-support labor income varies significantly depending on the size of income measures. For example, Peru, which registered the largest decline in post-support labor income, plunged 56%, and alongside that, a steep decline in working hours of 59%. Uh, the United Kingdom experienced the smallest impact of post-support labor income, um, which is only a decline of 3% compared to an 18% drop in working hours. For the United Kingdom and Italy, uh, they relied largely on large-scale uh, job retention schemes, which subsidized the income of workers on furloughs. So what we see is that job retention schemes, if implemented on a sufficient scale, can be effective in containing the spillover effect from working hour losses of labor income and employment losses. Secondly, young workers aged 15 to 24 are experiencing a much larger decrease in post-support labor income than the overall population. The difference is very substantial, ranging from 2% in the United States to 18% in Peru and Vietnam. Um, overall, I think this indicates job retention scheme schemes have been less effective in protecting young workers uh, rather than the general population. The third finding we have is that the COVID-19 crisis has had a disproportionate impact on the self-employed. In Peru, for example, the gap between the decline in post-support labor income for employees and for those who are self-employed stood at 21%. Um, our data in Italy suggested that income support and other policy measures have not been as effective in protecting the livelihoods of the self-employed as those of those who are employed. Fourthly, uh, women have tended to experience significant drops in post-support labor income in some, but not all countries, but uh, largely across the board, women have suffered tremendously during COVID-19. Uh, the fifth finding is that losses in the post-support labor income have been highest for workers in low and medium skilled jobs. Uh, we have seen this actually, the trend that's been uh, happening for a while, that workers in low skilled occupations, uh, sorry, in high skilled occupations, managers, professionals, technicians, were affected to a lesser degree than other workers in Brazil, Italy, Peru, and Vietnam. Workers in medium skilled occupations, clerical service, uh, skilled agriculture, uh, and uh, machinery workers, as well as low skilled occupations, experienced comparatively larger losses in post support labor incomes than higher skilled workers. Finally, inequality is likely to increase uh, as the result of uh, the type of job losses that are generated by the crisis. So for example, in the United States and the United Kingdom, significant job losses had occurred at the lower end of the labor market income distribution, while higher paid jobs were largely left intact. In middle income countries, the pandemic has reduced employment at both lower medium skilled, uh, lower medium paid jobs, and whereas higher paid jobs uh, decline in the post labor income occurred 
instead of job losses. So as we look ahead, what is the ILO strategic approach? So building back from the COVID-19 pandemic, the ILO draws upon a human-centered approach, which has been articulated in our recent Future of Work report. This report orients the economy towards a human-centered growth, uh, though through economic and social policies and business practices that are focused on investing in people's capabilities, investing in the institutions of work, investing in decent and sustainable work. And with this lens, the ILO recommends policymakers focus on the following priorities. Macroeconomic policies will need to remain accommodative in 2021 and beyond to combat large uh, deficits in income losses generated by the pandemic. So fiscal stimulus packages, particularly income support measures, continue to be necessary to protect households and businesses and to boost aggregate demand. Also, investment spurred by public investment is crucial to rebuilding economies and creating jobs. The second uh, policy recommendation is that international action to support low and middle income countries will continue to be critical. As many of you know, developing countries not only have limited financial means to buy vaccines, but are also constrained in implementing the economic and employment policies needed to support the recovery. The continued impact of the crisis, in particular on young people in these countries, can undermine growth and potentially cause long-term structural damage and increasing informality. And all of this really threatens to undo significant achievements that we have uh, seen uh, in poverty reduction made over the last few decades. The third policy prescription is that the crisis has been particularly devastating on the vulnerable groups and sectors around the, the globe. I mentioned initially young women, uh, sorry, young people, women, low paid and low skilled workers who have a less potential to achieve a quick recovery. And the risk of long term scarring or detachment from the labor market is unfortunately high. So policy measures need to be targeted towards them. The fourth policy prescription is looking at carefully balanced sectoral policy dimensions uh, in recovery strategies to support sectors that have been hardest hit. So these measures need to assist businesses, particularly SMEs, uh, small and medium scale enterprises, and workers and job seekers as they adjust to the post COVID-19 economy. Uh, this includes the uh, improvement of employment services, active labor market policy programs, skilling initiatives uh, that will all adapt to these new realities. Uh, against this backdrop of structural change and persisting deficits, policymakers will need to seize the opportunity to develop and implement recovery strategies through social dialogue, which uh, we uh, say as communication between employers and workers. And that will help reshape the trajectories to meet longer term needs for social progress and economic growth. Um, in closing, Dan, if you will allow me, I would just like to close with two quotes that are very important to me personally and to the work we do. The first quote is from His Excellency Archbishop Paul Richard Gallagher, the Secretary for Relations with States from the Vatican, speaking recently at the ILO, stated, by investing in people, we will create a wealthier and more just society in which persons will find by their work, their complete identity, the fulfillment of their aspirations, and finally, the efficacy of their talents. The second quote, which I believe captures the essence of decent work and has inspired me personally to undertake recently a photographic initiative before COVID, traveling around the United States, interviewing workers and talking about how work is important to them and what it means to them, is from a speech by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, that was delivered at the American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees in Memphis, Tennessee on that fateful uh, time uh, in March of 1968. Uh, to quote, so often we overlook the work and the significance of those who are not in professional jobs, of those who are not in the so-called big jobs. But let me say to you tonight that whenever you are engaged in work that serves humanity and is for the building of humanity and its dignity, it has worth. All labor has dignity. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin. Our next speaker is Thea Lee, president of the Economic Policy Institute, the nation's premier economic think tank for foregrounding the interests of working people, which I would argue means that it's the nation's premier economic think tank. Before heading EPI, Thea previously worked at the AFL-CIO, the major federation of uh, over 50 North American unions representing 12 plus million working men and women, 
There she served as deputy chief of staff, policy director, and chief international economist. We've asked Thea to give us a window into the pressing labor concerns at the national level, and I'll turn it over to her now. Thea. Thank, thank you so much, Dan, uh, for inviting me to be part of this incredible panel tonight. And it is an honor to be here with you and with Kevin and with Karen and with all of you who are, who are out there listening tonight. So thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. So this is an extraordinary moment in history. It's a moment of pain, of loss and isolation for all of us. We've seen massive economic dislocation and disruption. And as Kevin said, what's true globally is also true in the United States of America. Um, about 25 million workers have been negatively impacted by COVID so far. Either they've lost their jobs or they've had to drop out of the labor market uh, because of care needs, uh, or some of them are just experiencing cutback hours or income because of COVID. And we know that there's been an enormously unequal burden from this unprecedented pandemic. The twin crises, the economic crisis and the health crisis together have highlighted and exposed the deep racial and gender inequities in our economy. And, but we also see disparities by age, by profession, by geography in the United States. And uh, as, as Kevin said, which is happening at the global level is also happening in the US, that the number of jobs and the unemployment rate for the top quintile are essentially unchanged or even improved slightly, while the job and the income loss is very concentrated in low wage sectors and experienced largely by women and people of color and by immigrant workers. Uh, Peter Atwater had a nice phrase, we see stacked inequity on one side and stacked privilege on the other. More women have lost their jobs than men and black unemployment both started higher and is recovering more slowly than white unemployment. This is the stark reality of our economy today. Much of this was true before COVID, but it has really exacerbated. The, the fault lines have been um, brought into closer focus by this crisis. And I think, and the other thing that we've learned is that the inadequacy and the dysfunctionality of our social safety net and our economic policy infrastructure. But it is also a moment of opportunity and optimism and hope. So I wanna talk about both of these tonight. So, and I thought I'd take a little detour to talk about Catholic social teaching. I was not brought up in the Catholic tradition. Uh, if I were to describe myself, I would say I'm a Chinese Jewish atheist. Uh, my parents met and married in the 1950s my dad was born in China, came to the US and was brought up in Boston's Chinatown, became an architect and an urban planner. My mom was a free spirited and rebellious Jewish girl brought up in Queens over a grocery store. And they married each other more or less to be uh, kicked out of their traditional families and to reduce any expectations, cultural, familial or religious expectations on them. And so our family was basically created its own culture and its own ethical code. But the principles of Catholic social teaching are very familiar and appealing to me nonetheless. Um, and I think they're very relevant to the policy debates that are raging right now in Washington and can be very instructive for us. We talk about dignity and solidarity and rights and responsibilities. And I think it's important we think about rights and responsibilities of what are the rights and responsibilities of businesses and government and citizens and workers? And of course, tonight we are talking more and we should be about the rights uh, of workers to adjust wage to dignity and to the right to collect a bargaining in a union and a voice at work. But the other pieces of those Catholic social te te teaching about the care for the earth and the option for the poor and the vulnerable. I think these are extremely important for us all to keep in mind as the Congress debates and we have the partisan debates and the economist debates about what kind of relief and recovery package we need, what kind of structural changes are we looking to make? Are these just temporary fixes for a temporary problem or should we be looking much deeper? So these are the challenges we face as we welcome a new administration to Washington and a new Congress 
and we're just 60 days into the new administration and they've, they've been busy. They're putting in place a lot of new policies. So the way I would put it is our challenge is can we turn the pain and the loss of the pandemic year into lessons that will guide us going forward? And what I think we need to aim for is a shared appreciation of the infinite value of human life, of the utmost importance of solidarity and community. We are all dependent on each other. And we saw this, I think, very vividly during the pandemic crisis and about lifting up the dignity and the rights of working people. We saw, especially in those early terrifying and unsettling weeks and months, how essential workers risk their lives every single day to keep us safe, whether it was uh, healthcare workers caring for us, changing our bedpans, uh, monitoring our ventilators or those of our loved ones, the people stocking our grocery shelves, transporting us to and from work, those picking the crops or processing the food that we eat or delivering our packages. All of these folks put their lives at risk every day when they got up and went to work. And yet they did so without key protections that they needed and that we need. They did it without paid leave, without combat pay for the most part. Uh, and normally, actually, I'll just take a little digression here about neoclassical economics. Economics would tell you that if, if your job overnight becomes more risky and even deadly, that maybe you ought to see some kind of compensation in the form of higher pay. And some workers did get a temporary boost in pay, mostly unionized workers, but not everybody. And a lot of those temporary boosts went away, even as the risks remained there. And I think what that tells you, especially because unemployment was so high, that, um, that the neoclassical labor market theory doesn't really understand how wages are set and why wages are set. So uh, those essential workers didn't have paid leave. They didn't have universal health care. They didn't often have protective personal equipment or a guarantee of a healthy and safe workplace or healthy and safe practices where, you know, if customers might be put off by workers wearing a mask, then employers sometimes did not require that. And they certainly didn't have the right to a union. I'm just gonna adjust my lighting. Um, and even our unemployment system, our unemployment insurance system was criminally slow and antiquated, underfunded and understaffed so that in the middle of the crisis, when tens of millions of people had lost their jobs, so many people desperate for, for the income support spent hours or even days or even weeks on the telephone just trying to get through. And that's, that's not right in a wealthy country like the United States of America. But what did we learn or what should we have learned? Well, one thing I, I would say is that an economic system that is tilted too heavily towards the economic interests of the wealthy and corporations is not just inhumane and cruel, but it's also dysfunctional and economically inefficient and unsafe for all of us. So if the least among us is unsafe, we learned during the pandemic, we are all unsafe. If our barista doesn't have paid leave and has to go to work with a cough, we're at risk. We saw that immigrant workers in Singapore uh, caused an outbreak that impacted the whole society. Meat packers in Utah. We learned that if nursing home workers earn so little that they need to have three jobs, then they might end up infecting uh, people at three different workplaces, especially if they don't have uh, paid leave and they can't afford to stay home when they're sick. And if our economic system and our labor market allows and encourages systematic racial discrimination and occupational segregation, which we've seen, uh, then we will not fulfill our potential as a society and an economy because we will be squandering the talents and the energy and the enthusiasm of too many children. But the good news is that the government response to the pandemic has been effective and has mitigated a lot of the impact of the pandemic, not all, of course, it was very far from perfect, but it was vastly better than what it could have been. And then even what past government responses have been to recessions, and this is not a normal recession, of course. So in 2020, Congress did step up amazingly and miraculously 
with pretty major relief bills and $3 trillion was put on the table and expanded unemployment insurance and stimulus checks and aid for small businesses in uh, temporary paid leave uh, and state and local aid, which were, in my view, the key elements of that. And it made a difference. It made a difference. The uh, JP Morgan Chase Institute collects a lot of data on incomes and they saw that, and we've seen this throughout, that poverty fell and incomes actually rose during that initial part when the unemployment insurance checks, the $600 a week stim, um, expansion and the expanded eligibility for unemployment were in place. Now that felt, that went away at the end of July because Congress is incompetent. Uh, but during that period when that was in place, people's incomes actually rose and poverty actually fell. That's extraordinary and that is a success story. And yet Congress has been so um, uneven and unable to reach consensus at crucial moments that we've seen people support it and then fall off a cliff. And that doesn't make any, any kind of sense. It doesn't make moral sense and it doesn't make economic sense. Just a few weeks ago, con the Biden administration put forward in Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, another $1.9 trillion. And that is at the scale that of what is needed. It included a lot of the key elements. It's not quite as much on unemployment insurance, but it extended it through, through Labor Day. More state and local aid, basically to help state and local governments prepare for a safe reopening, for vaccine distribution, uh, for school reopenings. That all costs money. It's not gonna be cheap to have social distancing, to have masks, to have ventilation uh, in places that need it. But that is important and that is hopefully what will happen as a result of, of that bill. Uh, but also, and very importantly, an, ex an extension and expansion of the child tax credit. This is something that we've been talking about for a long time of making sure that for the very poorest families, uh, they can afford to, uh, to support their children. And our previous uh, policies in this area often had this gap, which is if the parents weren't working, they got nothing for their children. And that doesn't make sense. It's not the parents, uh, it's not the children's fault if their parents don't have a job um, or, and can't or don't work, uh, but also equitable vaccine distribution. So that is all incredibly important. And our challenge going forward, we see if we can make some of those elements permanent, paid leave and the child tax credit. The child tax credit is expanded for a very short period of time. My hope is that people will see that if we can lift half of American children out of poverty, that we don't want to revert and go back to putting those kids back into poverty 12 or 24 months from now when this bill expires. So we need to find the resources as a society to do that. And there's a next tranche being prepared right now, which I think is also really important. And it talks to some of the issues that Kevin raised, which is um, not just uh, closing the, the gap that was left by the pandemic and the people who lost their jobs, but really building back better, not to be corny about it, and trying to figure out how we can actually run this economy hot for a couple of years so that there are real opportunities for people who maybe have been marginalized by the labor, mar labor market or who had been stuck in the bottom tier of low paying jobs that we can create not just more jobs, but good paying, professionalized, well-paid jobs unionized jobs uh, for people who want it. And I think that is a tremendous um, aspiration and I hope that Congress will be able to stay united enough to do it. So it includes three big elements, uh, traditional infrastructure, which we need because we have really neglected our physical infrastructure over the last couple of decades, our roads and bridges and transport and waterway systems, our electrical grid, but also a real focus on climate change, renewable energy. And this is something that is long overdue, but also really can be, um, can be targeted to make sure that we are creating good jobs in a lot of communities that need them for populations that have not had access to those good jobs before. And finally, the care economy, where there is, I think we saw this during the pandemic, a burning need uh, for better, and more and better remunerated and better training 
for child care workers, for nursing home workers, for home-based and community services, for healthcare workers. And so for as a society, if we value these things, we need to invest the resources to make sure that the people doing this important work um, are protected and have the right to unionize if they want and are getting enough pay to sustain themselves and their families. And, uh, and the last couple of elements that I think are important as we think about it is how do we rebuild bargaining power for working people in this economy? And that I think will help us figure out how we can not just have to throw money at things but have workers be able to exercise their voice at work and their right to, uh, to form a union. So the Protecting the Right to Organize Act and the Raise the Wage Act that would raise the minimum wage, I think are essential elements of that rebuilding power and rebuilding the, um, the ability of working people to stand up for their own rights. And let me just end um, on two points, which is that the, um, this will involve a new and expanded role for government. And I hope that we have the consensus coming out of the crisis that we have all endured and suffered through to see that, um, that there is a new consensus among economists that, that really does see this issue differently than they did 10 or 20 years ago. And so I look forward to uh, further discussion and to your questions. And uh, I look forward to hearing from Karen next. Thank you. Thank you back to Dan. All right, thank you so much, Thea. And I would encourage people, I see if some questions are starting to come in. So I encourage our attendees uh, as we transition to our final speaker to start using the Q&A function. Uh, last but not least, by any means, we turn now to Karen Kent who's president of Unite Here Local One in Chicago, the Hospitality Workers Union. In 2013, Karen was elected as the first woman president in the century long history of Local One. She got her start in the hospitality industry more than 20 years ago, working as a server at various restaurants and hotels. In the late eighties as a banquet server and union, uh, union committee person at the Holiday Inn in Palo Alto, California, Karen began organizing the union. And since that time, she's led campaigns with Unite here all over the country, California, Las Vegas, New York, Dallas, and Chicago. Local One in Chicago, and I think Northwest Indiana as well, is made up mostly of women, people of color, and immigrants. In January, 2020, the union numbered 15,000 members. Today, roughly 70% of them are laid off still. Currently, the union is moving to pass the hotel worker right to return ordinance, among leading many other campaigns in the area. Karen and Local One clearly have their hands full, no doubt, um, and she'll speak to us from that level of the local. So Karen, welcome and thank you. Thank you so much for having me this evening. Really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Here we go. Play from start. Okay. Good. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Um, you know, it's funny. The last time that we were together in person was at. Uh, the Drake Hotel in Chicago in February of 2020, which was probably the last time that I was at that hotel as a patron and a customer. So, um, you know, I don't think that any of us foresaw what, uh, what was coming. You know, at that point, we were just having breakfast together, and it seems a lifetime since then. But um, as you said our union has about 16,000 members had and uh, you know we work in different parts of the hospitality industry uh, some of the airports Chicago public schools we have lunch ladies all over uh, sports venues all over Chicago and uh, McCormick Place convention centers and uh, hotels like the Drake um, and our industry has been devastated. There's uh, just no words to describe it. Um, this work, you know, I think it just uh, disappeared. And overnight, 
people um, saw their jobs just vanish. And so many of our members uh, were left in very uncertain times. Really, we faced uh, you know, the challenge of deciding what are the things that our members really needed? What did people need on a daily basis? What were the um, main things that the union should focus on? How will we grapple with things like health care? Um, you know, people needed a plan and they needed to figure out where, where they'd go for help and all these things. Uh, there was no set infrastructure um, when we started. You know, but we realized quickly that we had to be able to communicate with people. That was one of the fundamental things. We weren't going to be able to see people in the shops every day or have people come to the union office or see them at the health center. And so communication was one of our key uh, components of our plan. And so really changing that to a lot of texting and digital communication, making sure that we had a plan, um, you know, to communicate with people otherwise. And we launched a weekly program now bi-weekly called The Bullhorn, uh, runs every other Saturday on Facebook Live. So your folks here could watch it. Um, and I've got that address up, but it's facebook.com at Unite Here Local One. And, uh, you know, we go over, we decided that we needed to talk with folks about um, what are the things they needed to know on a weekly basis or biweekly basis? Who are the, you know, what are the events that are developing? How can we, uh, you know, have part of a series that talks about the tools that people need to uh, go forward? And in particular, I'd say just in general, if you think about it, um, you know, in terms of communication, if people don't have enough money, they can't keep their phone on. And that's sort of one of the basic things about uh, something as simple as that. Um, you know, we also realized that people fundamentally would need money and uh, how quickly um, it became apparent that there were so many people who were, um, um, who were hungry. It's kind of um, hard to imagine um, in this day and age, but that's really um, true. So we set about to do some fundraising. Uh, we had a website set up where we could um, be able to take in funds and just a tremendous response. We did that throughout our friends and family and people that we knew and advertised it and uh, we started almost immediately uh, using the money to buy food cards for people. So food cards in $25 denominations and, you know, almost 5,000 food cards we delivered, you know, to this day, we delivered another round about another uh, 700 around the holidays for people for Christmas and and Thanksgiving, and we've, you know, most of the money, all of the money that we've raised with Local One has been uh, spent towards food cards, and that's made the difference in people's lives. And that was done with all uh, largely volunteer operation. Our, our members, you know, came in and drove their cars and drove, uh, dropped off to people around the city. Uh, I should say also that in terms of solidarity, I have, um, there's nothing like Chicago labor and the Chicago community, the United Way, the Chicago Community Trust, the uh, Chicago Federation of Labor, all Illinois AFL, all of them. Uh, we just have outstanding, tremendous labor and a lot of, um, you know, great, uh, great leaders and, um, Anyways, just really, truly believe in this and uh, solidarity was immense. And I can tell you that we, they raised a tremendous amount of money for a lot of folks that were really in desperate need. And, you know, uh, it was less than a half a million dollars, but it was quite a lot of money that people raised. I just don't want to say the exact amount, but it was really, you know, they, they outdid themselves. So uh, thank, thank God for Chicago labor and the community at large. Um, also, uh, so we also figured that we had to make sure that we 
communicated and advocated for our members and talked about the issues uh, that people were most in need about. And so in thinking about, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about this was everybody was almost uh, immediately very accessible and so, or much more accessible. So our Senator, Senator Durbin, uh, one of our senators, Senator Durbin was just wonderful. Uh, he had been with us on the picket line when we were striking for healthcare a few years ago, we reached out to him again. He was on Zoom with us. He invited us to press conferences. We uh, talked with him on a regular basis. He invited folks to speak on various press conferences and talked about the, our member stories on the floor of the Senate. He also, uh, uh, so he was tremendous. And on the left is Jan Schakowsky. Um, a number of us met with her so many times and she's also been a tremendous advocate. Uh, this is Rashonda Williams who has spoken many times on Hands Off, Pants On campaign and, um, I just wanted to play a little clip about something she's pictured from uh, um, the I Senator Durbin. And now through no fault of my own, I'm feeling worthless, underappreciated, and I just cannot believe that we are having this conversation right now for people who have given their lives to work in the U.S. of A. That was a press conference with Senator Durbin and, um, you know, that was carried widely, but I think the message that Rashonda spoke about the frustration of workers and sort of um, just watching what had happened and suddenly being faced with this, uh, you know, enormous crisis and how do you sort of tell that story to the world? Because oftentimes I think that, you know, there's people who are, so removed from uh, what's happening. So, um, you know, the other thing is that people really needed health care. We had people who were going to lose health care, we were very concerned about. And we also recognized that people needed to, you know, have some uh, see one another. <laughs> I just say that it was important to sort of keep the essence of the union too. And that's why I think the things like what we've done are, uh, were so critical in keeping the union together. Uh, I'll just say that in terms of healthcare, uh, you know, many people think that there's different options or a lot of different safety nets, but really uh, it's very difficult when people lose healthcare to find a substitute for you know, um, benefits like the ones that a lot of our members enjoy. So fortunately we had the ability to extend healthcare for an additional three months. Uh, many folks, many of our members of the 16,000, probably 12,000 were on Unite Here Healthcare, but you know, thousands lost coverage in September, October and November. And I can tell you that when people lost healthcare, I can't tell you how many folks have gotten diagnosed with uh, cancer and, you know, really needed treatment and didn't have a place to uh, go or were off of life insurance and, um, you know, somebody lost their health care, their life insurance lapsed as a result. And, uh, you know, one of passed, you know, when someone I know passed away, uh, the day that he lost his health care and, you know, as a result, his family didn't have any life insurance. So anyways, uh, but uh, we definitely sort of uh, were able to lobby for additional health care for a number of folks. And of course, uh, you know, got the employers to pay some more, did some more from our fund. And now we've seen um, the COBRA plan, which is part of the American Rescue Plan, which will really save people's lives. Um, I think about just in terms of warning and in community, um, 
you know, how do people say goodbye to one another when you really can't be together um, in Judaism? You know, it's really um, critical that the mourner is able to be amongst community. And I know that's true in so many cultures, but it really felt uh, so hard to be alone and, and endure so much loss because there were so many people that we lost who passed away. And we thought that it was important to set, spend some time together uh, mourning and recognize that this was in um, the fall, probably September, October of 20. And we had an ofrenda and um, sort of lit things up and, uh, you know, allowed people to come and give uh, remembrances. Uh, and this is right off of Wacker Drive in Chicago. And uh, it was certainly really meaningful, but it's also identified that, you know, just in terms of our community and the people that we love, that people have been at work, uh, worked their whole lives with folks and not been able to um, be together. And, you know, you lose a coworker who is really part of your family that you spent every waking day at work with, and now you've been separated and there's no way to sort of share that grief. So there are pages and pages of, of pictures and posts like this for the people that we lost. And, uh, you know, that's just part of life now. And it's, you know, I think it's sort of a reminder about how, um, you know, how important it is to um, be together with the ones we love. This is, uh, I, I just love this because it was about, I see so many posts from people who miss their friends and their coworkers and sort of do a roll call with people and miss the, just their work in general. Uh, I'll say uh, just a few other things that we've done a lot of work on the vaccine to make sure that the union is a place where people can come and get information, that we have a conversation and a dialogue. We've been texting with folks and, uh, had a few webinars and making sure that, um, you know, the numbers like these change. Oh, earlier on, a lot of people didn't wanna uh, get it or were undecided, that's changed a lot. And I think, oops, sorry, organizing in the future. Okay, I bet it doesn't look very Notre dame -y, but um, <laughs> uh, we wanna think about, um, you know, in terms of what lies ahead, uh, getting people back to work, as you mentioned, we have, uh, we're organizing for an ordinance that will allow people to return to work in the hotels uh, and allow them to come back to their jobs when work comes back. We wanna think about keeping work safe, uh, future changes in the industry, and then organizing in the, I don't know, that's the food or something, but in the future. <laughs> So I'll stop there. Thanks. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Thanks, Ray. It's a you know it's a serious and sobering picture, uh, and we're very grateful that you shared it with us. Uh, what's striking to me at the same time is, even with the devastation in terms of unemployment in your sector in Chicago the union remaining a place for mobilization, for collective uh, grievance and uh, grieving as well as grievances, um, as well as just uh, the, the social space that we sometimes, when we're thinking in terms of economics, we lose sight that unions are, are social institutions as much as they are economic ones. So uh, I wanna thank you for that. So I wanna encourage uh, attendees to start uh, asking some questions in the q and I'm gonna ask each of our uh, panelists uh, what I'm gonna say is a quick question so we can get moving and get conversations going. And I'll start uh, with Kevin, just, um, I know we, at working at the ILO, you're, you're probably not able to, to say this country is better than that country, Kevin, but I am interested in, in pushing you a little bit on best practices. I mean. You know, uh, hearing about the importance of a human-centered approach in economic development, can you speak to either a country's policy or an international cooperative policy that you might consider a best practice that really centers the human? Uh, we, we talk so much about 
economics without the human, and all three of you have recentered us that way. So, no. any thoughts on that? Um, you know, it reminds me of a quote uh, Sigmund Freud had said that work is a way of keeping us rooted in reality. Um, you know, work is a way that we interface with the world around us. Um, so if you are not focused on the people who are creating the goods and the services that you need to move forward as an economy or as a nation or as a community of nations, um, you're really missing the point. Um, some of the policies, and uh, I encourage you to go to the ILO's site, there is a whole section on comparative uh, policies that governments have enacted. So for example, in Germany, they've created um, you know, uh, time banks. So everyone has contributed a few hours to the time bank so they wouldn't have to lay off employees which is not only good for the workers, but it's good for the businesses, right? Because if you have to hire somebody, it takes basically 18 months to really get that person up to speed and earn back the money it took you to hire them. Um, there are other countries that are, um, uh, and a lot of them in Europe, but also I think in, um, uh, in Asia as well too, uh, where policies such as social protection. So for example, social protection is a life uh, cycle approach. So it's providing nutritional assistance to young people it is providing access to education, access to health care. Um, you know, in the UK, um, we mentioned that people in their sort of, um, you know, post-support income, that hasn't, they haven't lost that because people are being given money uh, in order to pay the rent, pay their bills. Um, and that money goes right back into the economy. Um, so that's very, very important. So having a social safety net, as we would call it here, is very important. Um, but you have to strengthen that um, because there are people for no fault of their own that will lose their jobs. Um, and they have bills to pay, they have people to support. Um, and there's also the, I, I believe the, the, you know, kind of emotional and even mental health that we need as well too. I mean, women are disproportionately impacted on this. Women are leaving the workforce. You have to look after the family, you have to mitigate the risks, you have to keep everybody happy. Um, so, you know, they're not having the support from the government uh, actually just puts people at a, at a greater deficit. So, so there are a number of policies out there. The more comprehensive ones we'll see, you know, Canada has done great by, uh, by providing income support and, and uh, retraining of people as well too, because as been mentioned here, you know, the crisis, there's a, this is a crisis within a crisis. You know, we have been faced by mega drivers of change, climate change, it's impacting the world around us. Um, uh, introduction of global technology, uh, digital technology, people are losing their jobs. What plans are we making? Hyper-globalization, labor migration for jobs. Um, you know, we have uh, the demographic shifts in this country, uh, unpaid care work. I mean, I'm sitting home in my house here in New York because my wife had to quit her job to look after her mother. I mean, I'm not the only one in this situation and, and I have a professional job, but even for us, it's hard to make ends meet. And then now we have to add pathogens to this mega drivers of change. So, so there has to be a whole of system approach. There has to be a whole community of approach. And uh, there are a number of policies which are focused on supporting people because at the end of the day, people are not a cost, they're an investment. Thanks, Kevin, thanks so much. Uh, I'm turn to a question for Thea. I'm gonna ask you to prognosticate here. I know a, a couple of weeks ago, Thea, that you testified before the Senate Budget Committee in favor of the Raise the Wage Act. Um, and that would uh, uh, gradually raise the wage in the United States, federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, as well as I think eliminate the tipped, the tipped wage differential, which has, that, that tip, the wage hasn't been raised longer than 2009, which is the last time the minimum wage was raised. So prognosticator hat. One, what are the odds that uh, the Raise the Wage Act either in its current form or any form will get passed in this Congress? And then I'll, I'll pose a preference question for you. If you had to choose between $15 an hour or simply raising it and indexing it to inflation, is one of those more important than the other? Okay, uh, thank you, Dan. That's um, a big important question. So it, it is hard to predict what's gonna happen because I have to separate what I want to happen from what is likely to happen. Right now, the chances for the Raise the Wage Act aren't great because we saw that um, you know, first of all, it, it was ruled out by the Senate parliamentarian. So it wasn't, we weren't able to include it um, in the 1.9 trillion where uh, to his credit, President Biden had, had put it in there originally, which I thought was great. It was great to, to say that, what do we need for recovery from a pandemic that hurts low wage workers? We need to raise the wages for low wage workers. And this would have lifted uh, at least a million people out of poverty and raised wages for about 32 million people uh, over time, as you say. Um, so 
right now, you know, there were a bunch of Democrats, not just um, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, but several others, only 42 Democrats voted for the minimum wage in that, the context of that bill. And that's troubling. So part of what we all need to do is to go find those senators and the Republican senators. You know, there's no reason why this needs to be a partisan debate because in fact, uh, Republican constituents uh, like the minimum wage, it's popular. And even in red states like Florida and Arkansas, when it comes on the ballot, it passes in Florida just this last election, 61% of Florida voters voted to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour while they also reelected or tried to reelect uh, Donald Trump. So this is maybe a job for organizers. Uh, Karen uh, and all of us, we need to figure out how we can make politicians who do something unpopular, like vote against the minimum wage, make them pay a price. There are a couple of options right now. One is we can wait till 2022, get a better Congress and pa pass it then. The other is there might be some watering down of, of the bill uh, to something less than $15 an hour. I kind of hate to see it because, uh, you know, I think we did a lot of work to show that $15 is not extravagant that the economy can afford it. This is a very productive economy and uh, low wage workers create a lot of wealth and they ought to be able to um, get compensated for that. The question you ask about the um, indexing or the $15, I mean, the Raise the Wage Act did everything. It raised it to $15 by 2025 and then it would have indexed it to the median wage going forward, which is exactly what we thought was the right thing to, so that it, we wouldn't have to have this political football or um, charade every couple of years where um, you put the minimum wage at a certain level and then Congress does nothing for several years, it loses value slowly and then, uh, and nobody wants to talk about it. So I would love to see it indexed. Um, and I think one of the only dangers is I don't wanna see it indexed too low. Like if we can't get to $15, if we indexed it at something inadequate, then we might be locking in our ability to get further. So I'm not sure what's going to happen, but I think we should. We are not done fighting for this. Thank you so much, Thea. All right, I have, here's a question for Karen to follow up on um, on your your presentation. Karen, uh, could you talk more? Uh, well, maybe maybe you could say how you think uh, the Raise the Wage Act if passed. Would, would raising the federal minimum wage to 15 an hour impact um, your sector and your members? I know Chicago already has a higher uh, wage than the federal minimum. So maybe you could answer that. But also if you could talk more about that right to return ordinance, why it's so important, um, who it would impact uh, and maybe what's the what are the chances there for that? That's a city bill, I'm assuming an ordinance, right? Yeah, so I think anytime we raise the floor for workers, you know, that's a good thing. And there's certainly people who would benefit from having the minimum wage raised. Um, so yes, in favor of that and keep raising the floor and lift all boats. Um, in terms of, you know, looking at what people are facing, the hotel worker right to return ordinance, which is a city ordinance. And as proposed, it would bring workers uh, back to their jobs as the work comes back. You know, uh, there's been cases where people have, hotel workers have been fired um, after, you know, a few months uh, during the pandemic and are left without work. And it just, Disproportionately, as you know, Kevin and they have both talked about women, immigrants, people of color, and really we're sort of in an age of equity, but there's not an equitable solution to people being out of work and after a pandemic, like losing their jobs and not being able to return. And so we want them to be able to come back as the work comes back. When the guests come back, you know, the workers come back and that they'll go back to their jobs and be recalled in the same, you know, as they were laid off, so shall they come back to their work in the same place and to their position or, you know, a job that they could be, you know, trained to do easily. But that's really what we want. And we want to make sure we have those protections for people because you can't have a, a, 
really a holistic recovery without, you know, equity and people returning. Yeah, thanks, Karen. And, and maybe could you talk about, you know, that, that's a hope, hopefully a success to come, is that right to return ordinance? Oh, you, you had a big success, I believe, in Chicago, uh, maybe a year or two before the, the pandemic, uh, with the, the campaign, pants on, hands off, uh, the button, uh, uh, the button ordinance, maybe I call it. I don't maybe. Mm -hmm, can, yeah. The, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, you know, uh, really, we had heard a story uh, about sexual harassment in a casino where a young woman was uh, grabbed by a patron and asked to, you know, um, for sexual favors, which sort of provoked, um, you know, uh, the idea that we should really really know more about what's going on and dig in about harassment. Um, Sarah Lyons, along with a team of LOAs, who's an alum, uh, did a study in the hospitality of industry among hotel housekeepers and casino workers. And, you know, 49% of uh, hotel housekeepers had seen a guest naked, whether they opened the door or they dropped their towel or uh, anyways, far more rampant than even I knew, I'm embarrassed to say, but that what that did was provided panic buttons for uh, people that work in the guest rooms alone and in a hotel that's sometimes a city block long, uh, you know, nobody can hear you uh, if you're working by yourself. And so that's why the panic buttons allowed people to contact somebody wirelessly and be able to make sure that, uh, you know, that there was assistance if they needed it and also uh, make sure that people had a way to address harassment on the job, that there was regular training, that there's an agency for reporting if people have a problem and that they're allowed um, paid time away from work to do that. So uh, without fear of retaliation. So it was a great, uh, you know, landmark for us and our, our members and all the members who fought for it. And, people who stood with us, so. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's an example again, that work is not simply about wages, but it, that dignity <laughs> assumes a, a much larger, a more encompassing, um, you know, realm than, than just what you're paid and what benefits that you, you have. Um, but uh, de decent work includes dignity at work, and that's that's a classic example. All right, we we have a question that's that is gender specific and sort of root, it resonates with several points that that all of you made. So I'll throw this to all of you. Uh, there's this this Marshall Plan for Moms that has uh, come to the fore. Um, people organizing for. Um, and the, the question that comes from, from the attendee is, what, what are your thoughts on this Marshall Plan for moms uh, or, or, and maybe even a more universal plan um, that would cover and expand that social safety net that Kevin was, was really talking about earlier that other countries do more than in the United States. As Karen was just talking about, in the US, your, your life is so dependent still on the job that you have and your benefits and everything else is so tied to that. So uh, does anybody want to, want to tackle that question? The Marshall Plan for Moms, any thoughts on that? Dan, can you tell us a little bit more about what the Marshall Plan for Moms is? I'm afraid I'm not familiar with it, but it sounds intriguing. The Marshall Plan for Moms, from what I understand, uh, 50 prominent women in January called on the Biden administration to, um, to implement what they called a Marshall Plan for Moms to pay mothers for unseen, unpaid labor. So it's related to some of the things that folks have been talking about, the challenge for women more than men dropping out of the labor force. Kevin was referring to his wife doing caretaking work for, for her own mom. So it's direct payments to moms, I think, is the ask um, in, in order to you know, address the unpaid labor of home-based home care work. Uh, but it, then it also links to the things that you mentioned, paid leave, uh, affordable child care, pay equity. Um, so it's, a, it's an alliterative uh, attempt to sort of rethink uh, the unpaid uh, gender-rooted care work performed in the United States. Yeah, well, I, I am familiar with another proposal the National Domestic Workers Alliance is talking about um, 
the home and community-based services and how we can get Medicaid reimbursement to be at a higher level, higher rate of pay for home and community-based services. That would help a lot of moms, would help spouses and daughters. A lot of people who are, as you say, like, like your wife, Kevin, kind of trapped in um, caring for a, a relative or a friend and um, doing so either without adequate pay and one of the things we've seen about that is really good for the labor market because if we can do adequate pay, either we can professionalize and reimburse people who are uh, devoting themselves to caring for, for, for uh, relatives and sick people, or we can afford to pay uh, a professional to come in and do it. And either way, there is a, a positive spillover impact both on public health and on allowing spouses and daughters to re-enter the, the labor market safely. So, I mean, I think this whole area of the care economy is, is so important and I'm glad there's a lot of attention to it because I think we devalue care because it's done by women and sometimes it's done by people of color. And, um, you know, when, you, when we looked at the, the pandemic and we saw, you know, I don't know, white guys in suits in the finance industry, very um, protected and safe and, um, untouched really by, by the crisis, whereas the people who were putting their lives on the line uh, were not being taken care of. And I don't think that aligns with the kind of values that, that we should have as a society. So I think that's an important, a really important area and I'm, I'm glad people are paying a lot of attention to it. Um, could I jump in? Yeah, I, I apologize. Look, um, I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, there are a constellation of sort of policy prescriptions out there. I think pulling them together and really pushing in the same direction would be helpful. Um, we have to address the, uh, the pay equity gap. I mean, you know, women are paid in this country, you know, 23 you know, cents less on the dollar. But in many parts of the world, it's half of what uh, men get paid and sometimes even just a third of what men get paid. So that's a number one issue. Um, child care. I mean, child care is, is one of the um, stumbling blocks for most women globally uh, for going back into the workplace because there is no one that they'll leave their child with or there's no funds to do that. So having the part of your social protection of your social safety net in providing quality child care and access to education, pre-K education, these are all a part of what we call the social protection measures. Um, flexi hours, you know, not everybody has to work at the same time. So providing me now we know that we can work remotely, although working remotely is for those, you know, rarefied blue collar, white collar workers, not everybody could uh, work um, remotely. Um, you know, sanitation workers, police officers, bus drivers, um, serv uh, servers in restaurants and so on. everybody has to be there. But, but again, looking at flexible hours is very useful. Uh, looking at the unpaid care, which we were just talking about, and also the sharing of responsibilities. Um, paternity leave, you know, let's, let's have the men look after the children as well, too. I mean, it strengthens the family, but it also provides the opportunity going back to work. And on a personal note, my mother was a, a microbiologist working in the Rockefeller Institute, and my father was a New York City police officer. When she became pregnant in those days, she was the one who quit her job. It was my father who didn't, I mean, he was a unionized police officer, so the benefits were good, but my mother's earning potential was far greater and she had a higher level of education. So why is it that she would have to retire, uh, resign from work and then uh, look after the family without having a direct access back to the labor market? So, so I think that this is a very important point and without looking at both sides of the economy, women and men and encouraging women into the workforce, we're never really going to get over this, um, you know, this, uh, static in, uh, economy. Thanks, Kevin. I want to let, we only have a couple minutes left. I'll ask for I'll ask two more questions to try to respect the audience's uh, typing uh, commitments here. So, Karen, can you speak briefly to whether the union supports eliminating the tipped wage differential um, that the minimum wage has had customarily in the United States, and that creates all sorts of problems for wait staff that that's in some ways are similar to the housekeepers with the bed, the button. Um, so uh, it, it, does the union take a position on that? Mm. No, not it. <laughs> uh, you know, look, uh, we're, our folks are um, uh, mixed, uh, have a mixed feeling. So in fairness to our members, I think that there's a general um, you know, place where things are going and there's a tide rising, I think, you know, with the 
perspective about it. And I also, you know, we represent a lot of people who are on, you know, uh, have a lot of strong feelings about, um, you know, their income and that, you know, there's already a lot of changes in the industry. So I think that'll bring further change and it's being addressed, but I don't um, think I'd uh, represent my members uh, views if I had a lot of opinions about it at this point. Interesting. Okay. And that just shows that, uh, you know, unions are, are complicated uh, institutions that also uh, represent members with diverse interests. So thank you for being honest with us on that. Uh, Thea, there was a question about inflation and it was written, I think, uh, sympathetically to helping the poor and reducing inequality, but uh, wondering about if there is a fear with so much stimulus uh, coming out, is there a risk of inflation that might redound negatively and increase inequality, if you have thoughts on that one? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I would say I personally am not concerned right now about the risk of inflation. I feel like policymakers have been hypervigilant in the past couple of decades of paying much more attention to inflation and not enough attention to full employment. And we've paid a price for it. Uh, you know, coming out of the last recession, the 2009, 2010 recession, what we saw was that everybody was afraid inflation was gonna get out of control. So they pulled back on the stimulus too soon. And we had probably four more years of high unemployment and a slow recovery than we should have had. And right now there is an emergent consensus and even across party lines, uh, Janet Yellen, the new treasury secretary and Jerome Powell, who is the chair of the Federal Reserve who was appointed by, by Donald Trump, he's a Republican. Uh, the two of them are in agreement right now that the risk of inflation is pretty low. Inflation has been below target for many years now. And so what we need to do, I think, is really run the economy hot. And I think that will help workers at the low end of the income distribution much more. If there is inflation, I don't think there's a danger that it's going to be runaway inflation. And so, you know, at that point, we can pull back. But what we shouldn't do is pull back on the stimulus and the needed measures right now in fear that inflation might happen in the future. I don't think that's necessary. I don't think it's economically uh, desirable. And another thing, and I think it was uh, Secretary um, Yellen just said recently, is the other thing we can always do if we're worried about overheating is tax the rich. Now, she didn't say it in exactly those words. That's my paraphrase. But uh, raising taxes on corporations and the rich, uh, taking back some of the tax cuts that were made by the Republicans in 2017, is actually a pretty good way of protecting against overheating. And actually, I think that's, that's, um, it's indicated anyway, because some of these big structural changes we're talking about going forward, like making the child tax credit permanent, those will require some additional ongoing revenues. And so that's actually a pretty good solution right now is um, getting some more revenues. We are a lightly taxed country and we should raise the revenues we need to fund the programs that we need. So thank you for the question. And uh, I want to thank you for the answer. And, and the panelists saw their answers and presentations. I want to be very sensitive to their very busy schedules. I thank them so much for taking the time to be with us again this evening. Some people, it might be morning or afternoon somewhere where they're watching this, but it's evening here. Um, I want to thank Kevin Cassidy, Thea Lee, and Karen Kent for joining us and sharing with us what's been happening to workers. Uh, what they think should be happening for workers and what might be happening for all of us, whether it's in Peru, Brazil, Italy, Germany, as Kevin mentioned, whether it's in Washington, D.C., or whether it's in, in Chicago. Um, so please uh, reach out, take care of each other, uh, engage in that CST practice of solidarity, uh, and, and, and play an active role in trying to improve the lives of workers in your community. Uh, before I uh, say goodnight, I do want to uh, remind people that the conference will continue tomorrow. There's two final sessions at 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, starting Justice at Home, which is about justice within the Catholic Church itself. And that's followed at 11 a.m. Eastern Time by Justice for the Earth, uh, an environmental panel. So I encourage you, if you can, to make those. Uh, and, um, you know, thanks everyone for turning out uh, and, and uh, have a good evening, afternoon, morning, weekend.
have something good, please. Thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye.